Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here. My name is Giuseppe. I work for, for, I work for CERN, and in particular for the data acquisition of Atlas, which is one of the big experiments at CERN. So let's start with the, with the talk. No. Um, I'm, I would like to, to, to tell you a story that is the story of our Kubernetes journey in the data acquisition system of the Atlas experiment at CERN. And I have divided this journey into three parts, the departure, the adventure, and the reward. But before going deep into that, I would like to spend a few words about Atlas and uh, Large Hadron Collider, which is the accelerator providing the physics that we like. And Additionally, let me also give some motivations and the challenges that you are going to face introducing Kubernetes in our, in our system. So let's start with Atlas and LHC, and, the, uh, and this is Atlas. So this is a picture, a real picture in scale of Atlas. It's actually a big uh, detector, as you can see. And Atlas is one of the main, of the four main particle detectors at the Large Hadron Collider. And when I say huge, I say, I say that because Atlas is 44 meter long and 25 meter high. So really, really, really a little beast. And you see it has this uh, barrel shape with two end caps. And consider that, uh, that collisions are actually happening at the heart of Atlas. So Atlas is really built around one of the places where the collisions are happening. But what is the goal of Atlas? So obviously, uh, the goal of Atlas is to collect data from the proton collisions. But what does that really mean that Atlas has to collect this data? I will try to explain here in, uh, in, a, in a kind of few words. So at, uh, collisions at LHC are happening at a rate of 40 megahertz. So this means that every 25 nanoseconds, there, there are protons colliding into the accelerator. As I said before, the protons are colliding actually at the, in the middle of Atlas, really at the heart of Atlas. And the product of proton collisions are several other particles. So you have a, a huge amount of particles that are traversing the Atlas detector, all the active parts of the Atlas detector. And all the electric signals then are digitized, and uh, we have data out of collisions. And this is what we call an event, OK? So this is the event is the representation of the collisions for, for Atlas. So we can say, I will mention this word several times, event. So Atlas, the input rate for the events of Atlas is 40 megahertz, matching the, the collision rate of the, of the LHC. And what is the final goal of Atlas? As I said before, we want to collect this data, this physics event, and we want to save them to storage uh, for physics analysis, for further physics analysis. The point is that we want to collect the interesting event, the, the interesting events. We cannot collect everything because we cannot afford writing for a very sustained, in a very sustained way for years, for months, for years, uh, all, the, all the amount of data that we produce. So that's why we have uh, a way to filter event online. And this filtering is done in two stages. The first stage is hardware-based, so a decision is taken in a few milliseconds. And the second stage is software-based. So we have a kind of big farm uh, where our applications are running and are, are able to filter this event. And this is what I call the event filtering farm. And let's try to look also a little bit of how, how much data we are, we are managing. So uh, as I say, the first level of filtering is uh, hardware-based, and the event rate goes from 40 megahertz down to 100 kilohertz, corresponding to amount of data of more or, less 300, <coughs> more or less 300 gigabytes per second. So this is the amount of data that our event filtering farm, online event filtering farm, has to sustain. And then the second, the second phase of the filtering, as I, sa I said before, done by the EM filtering farm, reduces this amount of data down to three kilohertz. And this is the amount of data that we write to disk for, for I mean, for years, okay? So for years we write eight gigabytes per second. This is not the end of the story because we are working to upgrade the accelerator in what we call the high luminosity LHC and also, the, uh, the detector itself, Atlas, will be, will be upgraded. And as you can see, we are going to have higher rate, up to 1 megahertz inside input, as input for our Hayman filtering farm, corresponding to about 5 terabytes of data per second. And we are going to write to disk something like 50 gigabytes per second, again, for years. And where is Kubernetes in all of that? We want, actually, our goal is to use Kubernetes to orchestrate our online event filtering even filtering farm. So we are working on that. This is something that is going to happen in a couple of years from now, but we are doing already a lot of work to be sure that Kubernetes can do the job for us. And what are the, the challenges of, uh, of using Kubernetes in our online filtering farm? So let me point out, we are, work, we are talking about something that happens online that is at the very beginning of our, of our, of our dat data taking. So if anything is lost, if our infrastructure doesn't work properly, if our applications do not work properly, 
what is lost cannot be recovered. So we lose time, we lose money, and we lose knowledge, we lose physics. I've tried to, to summarize the challenges in, uh, into four main, main uh, items. So the first one is size. So we are going to have a kind of a big farm. Today we have uh, something like 2,000 servers corresponding to about 60,000 CPU cores. And in the upgrade scenarios for the high luminosity LHC, we are going to have uh, something like 5,000. This is uh, the, let's say, the conservative scenario with uh, about 500K uh, CPU cores. This corresponds also to high data volume and low latency. As I said before, we are going to move a lot of terabytes of data and also the time budget that we have, this happens in quasi real time. So the, the single event has to be selected or eventually discarded in less than one second. So we have to be somehow fast. Number three, we have a high number of uh, processing applications. So together with the 5,000 servers, we, the last estimates that we have, in the worst case scenario, we need to start something like 65,000 of uh, filtering application in the case of the LHC upgrade. Last but not least, readiness. So we need to be ready in a prompt way. Why? Because it's not a start and forget scenario. So the LHC provides collisions in, uh, in batches, if you want. So the LHC provides collisions for 12, 24 hours. And then the accelerator needs to be refilled again with protons, okay? And uh, we in Atlas, we have to be ready to start a data taking session as soon as the collisions are available. At the same time, so if something weird happens in our computing farm and we need to restart this application, we need to be fast because otherwise, as I, say, as I said before, whatever is lost at this, at this stage is lost forever. There is, there is no other way. So to summarize this first part, so we, what, what do we want to do with Kubernetes? Today, of course, we are able to manage our, our farm, but we do it with the, in a custom way, with custom software, all developed by us. So we have a custom process control, custom, schedule, custom scheduling. We have also intelligent pieces with the for, for error detection and, and management. At the same time, it's all based on bare processes. We do not support containers. So I'm not going to tell you how nice is Kubernetes, but let just me highlight a few, few points. Introducing Kubernetes, we would like to have a simplified operations and maintenance, of course. We would like to have a more dynamic scheduling that in our case is pretty static at the moment. We would like to enhance high availability and fault tolerance. And of course, we want to exploit containerization. Let's start with the journey. As, say, as said before, the first, the first part of this journey is the departure. And we started with that in 2018, so a lot of time ago. And at the time, we were just performing some preliminary studies to check, to verify that Kubernetes could do the job for us. And uh, wh what was our main goal? We, well, we actually had two, two main goals. First, we wanted to understand how fast we could start the pods. And also, we would like to understand, OK, but how this goes if we, have, uh, if we change the, the number of working nodes? So how this scales with the, with the number of working nodes? At the time, we had a very, a very simple, a very simple uh, system. So we were running Kubernetes version 1.5. Okay, it looks like ages, maybe it is, yes. Uh, we had a simple one single control plane node, and we were, we were able to put together up to 20, 20, 240 working nodes. And we were starting something like for more or less four, four, four pods per node in a very simple way. Single pods container, so we just want to measure how fast Kubernetes is without any, any other kind of of other load, the container was preloaded and everything was running in virtual machines. And the plot that you see on the right is, uh, is actually showing the time needed to start all the containers as a function of the, work, of the number of worker nodes. And what, what could, at the time, what we were able to extract from this information, so from sure, there was some good linear scaling. This is always good, uh, your system is predictable, so you can understand pretty well what happened. At the same time, it was taking something like 70 seconds just to start 1,200 pods, which was, I'd say, not, not, not really what we wanted to, to have. And then something happened. So I, I like to say that QPS went to rescue. So we were digging a little, at the time a little bit into the documentation and all the options that you could pass to the various Kubernetes components. And we noticed these. Uh, QPS values that you could pass to the controller manager and the kube scheduler. And we said, okay, but let's see what happens if we increase this. And we played uh, a simple game. So we say, okay, we take the default values of this and we just multiply for a fixed multiplier. And let's see how the performance goes, better or worse. And the result is on the left, on the plot on the left. Again, the same plot as before. The time needed to start all the containers as a function of the pods as a function of the working nodes for different values of this QPS multiplier, up to four times. 
And you can see that actually the time is greatly reduced. And if you look at the other plot on the right that shows the average starting, uh, the average pod starting rate, you can see that we were going from uh, less than 20 for the default configuration with uh, almost 50 for the, for the for a QPS multiplier of four. So what, what we could uh, say about that, what was the executive summary of this very preliminary test? So generally, the system was behaving in a good way, so linear scaling, all the, all the results could be reproduced pretty easily, and there was a nice performance improvement increasing the, the QPS with this, with this tuning. At the same time, what was not really, uh, let's say, at the spot, the pod startup rate was still a little bit too low. But anyway, results were reassuring, and we were confident that we could do something better to, to use Kubernetes in our system. And that is where the real adventure starts. So the, the previous tests were actually pretty nice, I would say, okay, reassuring, but there were a lot of questions without any answer. So which pod startup rate we, we, we could be able to reach, to, to achieve? What about the QPS limits? So we could increase this at whatever value, so we are just free store and performance increase. What happens if we are going to have a much larger cluster because we just tested for 240 nodes? And what if we put in place uh, some scheduling strategy? So what if we want to, to put the, po the pods exactly where we want and the way we want? And last, even the most important question, what happens when we increase massively the number of pods? Um, and the answer to this question was, well, our way to, have, uh, to, to get answers to this question was actually to do some systematic tests using the currently available computing farm at the Atlas experimental site. That you can imagine it's not easy because we are, even today we are taking data, we take data 24-7 and we don't have two farms or two accelerators or two, or two, two detectors. So this was anyway some challenging situation. But okay, we managed to, to, put a, to, to build a test setup at the experimental site. So we prepared our cluster with four control plane, uh, control plane servers, four dedicated ATCD servers, so three in a cluster, and one just used to send the events, the special events to, to it. And we were able to put together about 2,600 worker, worker nodes. And everything was uh, in bare metal, okay? No, no VMs, something like that. And what was the testing plan? So what we wanted to do? First of all, we wanted to study the pod startup, uh, startup and stop rate to see how these, uh, these scales. The usual, the usual strategy, post container, simple post container already preloaded on the machine. We also decided to, to, to put in place realistic scheduling, as I was saying before. So I want to put the pods in the worker nodes the way I want, not just the way Kubernetes wants. And we decided to exploit the cluster loader too and we just had the very little modification. So we, let's just follow the full life cycle of every single pod, and let's just print this data to a comma-separated value for further, for further analysis. And then, as I said, with the cluster loader tool, we can, uh, we can look at the single startup phases. So from the creation of the pod up to the watching phase. And the first thing that we did, we went back to the QPS and said, okay, let's see what we can really do at scale with QPS. So we prepared uh, um, a cluster of 2,000 worker nodes. We started 10,000 10, pods and in the configuration that you can read on the slide. So we use those network. I will come later why we use those network. We have some good reasons for that. And uh, we used a very simple deployment and uh, it was at the time a Kubernetes version 1.122.21. Uh, and then we set the API QPS equal to the API burst, which is a little bit strange, but we made a lot of tests. And in our use case, in our case, there were no real changes putting a higher value for the burst. And the two, and the two, the two tables that you can see there are showing actually the startup and stop times for the different configuration of QPS values, both for the scheduler and, uh, and the controller managers. So without going too much into the details of the, of the numbers, because they may be actually relative to our setup, but there is, there, there is something that we can extract from this, from this data. So let's look at, at the startup time. First of all, any changes in the scheduler QPS are only relevant for a controller manager QPS higher than 400. Second point. For a scheduler QPS of, of, of 200, actually there is no gain in changing further the controller manager QPS. What about the stop time? Much easier. So the stop time was completely independent of the scheduler QPS, and the stop, time were, uh, the stop times were actually better with higher QPS for the controller manager. 
So given these observations, we decided to set our working points, and we said, okay, we use 800 for, both, for the QPS of both the controller manager and, uh, and, uh, and the scheduler. So all the results that, are going to, that I'm going to, to show in the next moments are referring to this configuration. But, okay, we see, we see these results, but why? So we want to understand why, if we increase this or that, the results change. And at that moment, we started looking, as I was saying before, to the startup phases, to all the phases for each single pod. And the graphs that you can see here are actually referring to the same configuration. The only thing that changes is the value of the controller manager QPS 400 on the, 400 on the left and the 800 on the right. And the profile shows the number, the, this plot shows the number of pods for each single phase as a function of time. So what you can see is that, what we can learn again from that. So clearly, if we increase the controller manager QPS from 400 to 800, we see a nice increase in the creation rate. So the pods take much shorter time to be created, while there is actually no, no, no difference for the other, for the other, for the other phases. And let me also point out that the configuration is exactly the same as before. So 10,000 pods over to 2,000, 2000 nodes. And this explains what we have seen before, right? So we, we can clearly see why if the controller manager, QP, the, if the controller manager QPS was not high enough, any increase in the scheduler QPS could not lead to any result because the limiting factor was actually the controller manager. So this was giving at least an explanation to what we were observing. And what we learned, so let's first summarize what we'll end up to now. So lesson number one, some QPS tuning is needed in large clusters to improve pod startup and stop times. Lesson number two, scheduling time may actually be a bottleneck for large deployments. This was the first stage. Okay, we have understood what happens. We have a clue of what happens with the, with the QPS. But then what if we want to schedule the pods the way we want? Let me first say what is uh, our main goal. Our main goal is to try to demonstrate that we can do what we do today with our system, with our custom system, with Kubernetes. And what we do today, we fill the farm that we have as much as we can in a kind of uniform way, okay? And this is what we, we want to achieve with Kubernetes as well. We want to demonstrate that we can do what we do today, even with Kubernetes. And we, we attack the problem with, in two different, from two different perspectives. So the first one is the strategy to deploy. And we used three different strategies. The first one, a simple deployment, and we were using resource description to properly distribute the, the pods over the cluster. The second one is a deployment with a topological spread, where the topological zone is the single node. So we could say, okay, let's start five, five pods per node using the topological spread. And the third one, a little bit uh, less orthodox if you want, multiple demo sets. So I want five pods per node, I start five, five demo sets. It's not really easy, I mean, but it's, it was worth uh, testing, at least from a performance point of view, to understand better. And the second perspective to attack the problem was configuration. So let's try to see what we can do at the scheduling level. We can create, for instance, a custom scheduler profile, or we can also tune the number of, uh, the percentage of nodes to score, because again, we want to populate the full farm, so we don't really need maybe to score too many nodes. And let's look at the results for the first part. So the scheduling strategies. The, pods, the, the, the plots that you can see refer to the three different strategies that I've shown before. And again, is, is uh, the time needed to start all the pods as a function of the number of working nodes, worker nodes in the cluster, and for a different number of pods, in, uh, for pods per node, from one up to 10, which means that we reach the maximum of 26,000 pods over 2,600 uh, 2600, uh, uh, servers, worker nodes. And we were using for this Kubernetes, Kubernetes 1.28, 1, 1, which is actually what we did the last, last year. So there is clearly a dependency on the start time f f upon, the, upon the strategies, with the topological spread being the most expensive one. So you can see that this stops to 200 seconds. The simple deployment with the resource description on average, and the fastest one, the, 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 multiple, the multiple demon sets. And again, nice to see this, but why? And uh, to find a question, we again, we started looking at the single phases of the pod startup rate. So the first thing that you, we can observe is exactly the same plot as before, huh? a profile of the number of pods as a function of time for each phases. And we can clearly see that there is, there is no change, more or less, in the time needed to create the, the pods. So all the pods reach the, creation, the created phase pretty fast, 
And if you look at the rate, if you look at this plot, at the rate on which pods are created, so this value is pretty close to the 800 QPS value that we have used to configure the controller manager. The other thing that you can see on the plot is also the scheduling rate for each case, so on the, on the right y-axis. Y and in the other cases, what is improving is the scheduling rate. So the scheduling rate is going from 135 for the simple deployment up to more than 700 with the, using the, the multiple daemon sets. And it's also interesting to look at, the, at this, uh, this pattern that sometimes happens with the, with the scheduling rate. For the, for the topological spread, this goes a little bit up and down. For the simple deployment, it's a little bit constant, decreasing uh, towards the last five, 50 seconds, while for the daemon sets, it's more or less constant. And again, what we can extract more from this data. So it's clear, it's clear that there is some kind of relationship of scaling low, correlating the time needed to start the, to start the pods with the number of working nodes and the number of pods per working node. But can we, for instance, try to see if there is a more generic, more general scaling law, which correlates just the number of the time with the total number of pods. So we convolute the, 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 the number of working nodes with the number of pods per node. And the result of this is on the two plots that you see. And actually, yes, I would say that, yes, there is a, there is a nice linear scaling correlating the total time with just the total time of, of the total number of pods that we are going to start. And the two plots that you see are actually the same. They just use different colors on the left to, to group the, the data referring to the same number of working nodes, and on the right to group the data the referring to the same number of pods per, work, per working nodes. And if we, use this, uh, if we assume that this linear correlation is, is correct, then we can use all the data that we took to, to calculate, the, the, to, to compute the average pod startup rate, so just fitting with a straight line the data. And you can see clearly that the most demanding, uh, the most demanding deployment of the topological spread is uh, around 133 hertz, and we reach almost 700 with the, with, the, with the daemon sets. So again, summarizing, what we have learned from this? Lesson number three, scheduling strategies do impact the pod startup times, in a way. And lesson number four, global pod startup times seem to depend on the total number of pods only. It's not the end of the story. As I said before, the other thing that we tried, let's try to, we tried was to configure the scheduling in such a way that we can improve the scheduling throughput. What we did, we defined a custom profile that we call no scoring scheduler, because as the words say, we were just disabling all the plugins in the press score and score phase. And we also said, okay, let's try to tune the percentage of nodes to score. And we set this percentage to five. And let's see what happens. So the plot on the left uh, is uh, the plot that was described before, so with this uh, scaling law that we found. So the, the time as a function of the total number of pods to be started, you know, started into the cluster. And the three data sets refer to the, to the standard situation, okay, to the default scheduler uh, as, as it comes. Then we have the default scheduler plus the 5% scoring uh, of percentage of nodes to, scale, to, to score. And then at the bottom, the best results that we have is using a custom scheduler profile plus the 5% scoring. And the data in this case, in this plot, to refer just to, to give you an example to the, to the simple deployment with the host network. And the tables give, uh, give, uh, give you the result for all, for, all our, for all our cases. So clearly, there is a, a nice improvement in the, in the time to start 26,000 pods across the cluster. And now we go from 122 for the topological spread down to, again, 40, 44 for the multiple demon sets. As you can see, there is no impact on the demon set case. And this was somehow expected. And the, the improvement is even clearer if we look at the average pod startup rate in the, on, on the table on the, uh, at the bottom. So we, we, we had a nice increase of about 70% for the topological, for the, in case where the topological spread was used. And for the standard deployment with just resource, the resource description, we had a wonderful increase in the startup rate of, uh, of 280%. I didn't say anything, I didn't mention up to now anything about the hardware that we were using for the control plane, because obviously we can say, okay, you were using some very old PC and you get some crappy results. And this is, okay, we, we, all the results that I've shown before was with uh, some kind of modest hardware, yes, but that gave us the, the possibility to also study how this, our performance changes, changing, changing the hardware generation. 
So we were running up to now all the results that I've shown with the four servers for the control plane using a kind of uh, old CPUs. Then recently we increased the power of our, of our control plane, always four nodes, and again dual sockets, but this time with a much modern uh, CPU and with 10 gigabit technology. We didn't touch the TCD cluster because the TCD cluster was already let's say, state of the art with the uh, very fast and beamy disks and all, and all the stuff. And the plot here in the middle of the slide shows the, refers to a topological, to a deployment with a topological spread in the best situation. So we use already the custom profile for the scheduler. We use the 5% of scoring. And you can see how there is, a, how the new hardware actually had an impact. So the time to start all the pods, again, 26,000 pods went down considerably. While the two little plots on the right refer to the other two configurations where the gain, there is still some gain, but not as much as big as in the case of the topological spread. And the table shows, actually puts, puts in number, the increase that we had, the improvement. So you can see that for the deployment using the topological spread, we had an increase of the 50%. So we were reaching 340 Hertz. And for the de deployment for the multiple daemon sets, we had a more modest increase of performance of about 16%. But still, so we, now we were over 700 pods per second, which is much better than what we were observing in the past. But again, so we increased the power of our control plane. What is actually changing? And as before, again, the profiling for all the faces and uh, symbol case of the deployment. In our best case scenario, the custom scheduler profile plus the 5% scoring. So if you look at the creation time for the new hardware and the old hardware, this is exactly the same. So the creation time did not change at all. So this means that the new hardware, the much more powerful CPU that we were using, did not increase the performance of the controller manager. We also tried at this time, since we were having a lot of good CPU power, to increase even further the QPS <coughs> of the controller manager, sorry. We pushed up to 1600 from 800, but nothing changed. At the same time, again, we observe some nice improvements in the, in the running phase, to reach the running phase, to reach the watching phase, which is a hint that the scheduling was actually improving. So again, the scheduling was, uh, was uh, uh, the scheduler was able to profit much more of the new hardware. And this also explains why we were observing some uh, much better increase in performance in the most demanding case for the scheduling, which is when we use the, 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 the topological spread. Another thing that I, I mentioned before, we were using host network for all our tests, but what about the CNI? So first, let me say why we were using the, the host network. We were using host network because the inter-process communication system that our applications are using currently, it's, it works much better with the host network not using the CNI. At the same time, we want to explore, we want to be ready for everything, okay, whatever whatever the final applications will be that are still under development, we want to be sure that we can cover all, all the cases. So that's why we performed all the tests that I've shown before, even using a CNI, in this case, in this case Cilium, in version 1.14.1, with, uh, with the default configuration, basically. So we didn't, we didn't dig deep into the, into the Cilium case. And the plot on the left shows the pod startup time for uh, both the new and the old hardware with both the host network and, uh, and, uh, and the Cilium case, the CNI. While on the right, you have basically the same plot, but just for the stop time. I didn't talk too much, actually. With, I, didn't say, I didn't show too much about the stop time because it's a much easier case. So it just depends on the, com on the controller manager and the stop times were much more predictable. So that's why I didn't go deep into that. And what we, again, what we can learn from these two plots. So general observation, it, it looks like startup and stop times are higher than uh, you, when the CNI is used with respect to the case where the host network is used. At the same time, as soon as we improved our hardware, this difference actually went down. So this <coughs> seems related to the capability of the nodes. But again, why this? And we, again, we look at the profiling of the number of pods in different phases. So on the left, these two plots are actually, are actually the same. The only difference is one, the one on the left refers to the old hardware and the one on the right refers to the, to the new hardware. And on the left, you can see that the profile of the controller manager is not really a straight line as we were used to see. So maybe this was the first evidence, the first case where the controller manager was a little bit under stress. And as soon as we, inc we, we add a much more powerful hardware, the profile, again, starts to be a very nice straight line. The total time to create the, the pods went down. And yeah, so again, in this case, 
this, the, in, in this specific case, when the CNI is used, the controller manager was actually able to profit of the higher power of the control, of, of the control plane nodes. So what are the lessons that we learned from these uh, last tests? So lesson number five, custom scheduler profiles may greatly increase the, its throughput. So we can increase the throughput of the scheduler using some custom profiles. Scheduler, uh, lesson number six, better hardware for the control plane seems to improve the more scheduling demanding scenarios. And we are actually at the last phase of our journey, the reward, and what was, what is our reward? So if we go back in time, at the beginning of this talk, I say we started in 2018 and we were able to start just 20 pods per second. Today in 2024, for our use case, for our configuration, we are able to go even a little bit beyond 700 pods per second. And now we were able to achieve that with QPS tuning, with, cu with custom scheduler profiles, with different deployment and scheduling strategies, reducing the number of nodes to be scored, and last but not least, also improving the hardware that we were using for the control play. It's not the end of the story. So this is the end of this journey. Several other journeys, I think, are coming on. But today, what we can say? Today, we can say that we gained a lot of experience in operating a large Kubernetes cluster. We improved greatly the performance in terms of pod startup times. We profited a lot of the very flexible way Kubernetes offer us, offers us to schedule our pods. And we also profit of enhanced monitoring and operability of, of Kubernetes. Last but not least, very important, all the results across all these years, across all the Kubernetes releases are very, very predictable. That in our case is very, very important. What is coming tomorrow? Well, we want to scale even to more pods. As, as said at the beginning, we, in the final system, we may need to start something like 65,000 pods. And up to now, we tested our system up to 26,000. We want to evaluate node extended resources for simplified the scheduling. And we also, in case the startup times get too high, I think that's the moment we should evaluate whether we want to run more containers per pod. At the same time, we liked a lot what Kubernetes offers and the way it works. And now we want to try to exploit Kubernetes also for a different workload. So I said, we want to run our online filtering applications, but what about having a, a dynamic mix of both online and offline simulation jobs in our, in our farm? Why not? And what about, about Kwok? So the, as, as, as I said, our farm is not available all the time. Well, it's available for a very short time for doing our tests. And in a little bit more than one year, there will be no farm at all because the experiment will stop, the accelerator will stop for the upgrades. So using something like that allows us to simulate the scheduler behavior will be actually pretty, pretty useful. And that's the end of the journey of the story. So thanks for listening. And if you have any feedback, do not hesitate. ask a question sure um, specifically so why is it so important the startup time of the pods so because like I just want to understand the life cycle of the processes that you have do you want them like to start up finish certain given task and exit immediately or can they live like through it for a longer time uh, so the question is about why why we are so sensible so sensitive to the pod yes. startup times yes uh, the fact is that as I was saying at the beginning the um, the LHC has some cycles, okay? It's not a start and forget. So it's not, we are going to start our processes and we stay there for one month, two months. Uh, it may happen that uh, usually a data taking session is between, uh, let's say, 12, 12 hours, 24 hours. Then the data, the data taking session stops because the LHC has to refill. So we need to inject again protons into the accelerator. As soon as the LHC is ready, we need to restart basically all the infrastructure, all the applications, even why, from one data taking session to another one, the configuration of these applications may be completely different. So they do not, so let's say, survive because they need to be probably reconfigured. And we cannot afford to take, I don't know, 10 minutes to do that. 
If there is also another use case, something may go wrong during the run. There may be a bug unexpected in the, in the, in the pods, in the application that we are going to run, and we may need to restart all of them. And again, we need to be fast, otherwise we lose Beam, because LHC will not stop just because we have troubles with our applications. I hope this answers to your question. Yes, so th this does. And then just a technical one. So based on your uh, final findings, I assume that you are going with like deploy resource-based deployments as your sh main scheduling approach, Probably. not the daemon sets. Probably. Not the, well, the last resort may be the, the daemon sets. And uh, actually, we are planning to, to do all this deployment with a, an operator because we need to link the rest of the system with the Kubernetes cluster. And this operator application will actually be the bridge and at that point, since it will not be any way a human operation, we are free to use the, even the most complicated scheduling scenario. That's, that's also why I say that we want to try to evaluate these node extended resources, because then, I don't know, we may use a kind of uh, how many applications of this kind we want to start of this node, and instead of playing with the memory and CPU that is a little bit tricky, we may just use this extended resource, but we have to try first. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Uh, hi, uh, great talk, by the way. I think this, Thank was a, you. this was a really good lesson on how one should do post tests. So uh, not just the configurations, but we also- Sorry, can you, can you speak louder because I think- uh, I was going, this was a really good uh, demonstration of how one should run performance tests when you're trying to benchmark yeah. something and the way you plotted the results. So kudos on that. A uh, couple quick questions. So uh, one, how are you measuring pod startup time exactly in this case? Yes, I we, we are measuring these. Uh, this is something that comes with the, with the cluster loader too. As I, see, as, okay. I, as I said, we just add the few printout, and because cluster loader is able to track yeah. the single faces for each single pod, yeah. and we actually are extracting this time from uh, the result of the cluster loader too. I see. So you're basically parsing all those logs to see how. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Uh, and the second question I had was around uh, the final configuration you had on con uh, scheduler specifically. So are you only ranking like five percent of nodes to achieve seven hundred pods per second right now? Yes. I see, got it. And yes. you said the QPS to like 800 for on both. Because, because in our specific case, since we want to fill anyway the, the, the cluster as much as possible, yeah. we don't need to score because anyway, the pods have to I go see. everywhere. So for you, packing matters yeah. less. You just want it to be scheduled as fast as yeah. possible. Yeah, exactly. Correct. Correct. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are over time. We have time just for this question, for the last one. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I'm curious if you like uh, if you noticed uh, anything related to the time it takes to like volume attach for the images that you're going to run. As part uh, of no, we are not. Uh, as I say, we were just preloading everything, so we, this is something that will come. At the moment, we don't even have the final version of the applications that we are going to run, so we don't even know how big these images will be. Uh -huh. And in these studies, we just wanted to evaluate the pure performance of the scheduling of the, all the rest. So. We were not taking into account the time needed to pull the images. Yeah. Got it, got it, thanks. Okay, thank you.